Okay. I think we will ask sir to join back again and unmute. Yes, yes. Anil sir has joined. Her. Anil sir as co-host now. Yeah, doing. Yeah, Anil sir, am I
Hello, now can you hear me? Hello. 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 Yes, sir, we can hear you. I think there's an echo, but right. Hello. Can we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning to one and all. You know, sorry, there was a technical issue which forced us to have this delay. Um, today is World Physiotherapy Day, and we have rightly taken the topic as rehabilitation following COVID-19. You know, there's been a lot that all of us have seen. Many people have gone through a lot of things. Many have left us. Many have struggled and come out. But once they're out, what is it that you can really do following COVID recovery? There, nobody has talked about this. So I thought it is apt that we stand and talk to you about what do you do post COVID? How can you handle things? And where and when can you get help? Let me introduce myself to you all. I am Professor Dr. Anil Tijan. I head the School of College of Physiotherapy at Diamond Sagar University. I'm a consultant at various hospitals. I have my own clinic. I've been seeing a number of patients, helping them post-COVID, and we have had good recovery also. So many of them were really taken by surprise that yes, there's something called post-COVID challenges that they have. And I thought this is the time that we should highlight you all about things and talk to you about such things. Okay, we know that globally, millions and millions of people are getting affected with COVID-19. severe coronavirus, causing the coronavirus. That was caused by the coronavirus, which is called as COVID-19. Okay, many of them have confirmed COVID-19 patients. Many of them would have been admitted to hospitals, while people affected with mild COVID-19 nowadays are treated at home. Now, some will have severe symptoms, which require hospitalization because mainly of their respiratory. Out of these, 20% of them will be admitted to intensive care unit, which for the cause of what you call as an acute respiratory distress. Now, this is a little bit serious, which will require them to go on to a ventilator. Now, most of the people who are admitted will have a lot of comorbidities. What we say is other underlying conditions. That is what we call as comorbidities. It could be in the form of heart diseases, which you call as cardiovascular disease, or diabetes. And of course, India is now the diabetes capital, which will force them to stay for prolonged time in the hospital. Now, post-COVID-19, or patients with COVID-19, will have a need for rehabilitation either directly, which starts as early as from the hospital. Now, these healthcare services people should start these rehabilitative interventions in daily clinical practice as the number of patients are increasing rapidly. It should start as early as they are admitted. That is, in the hospital. Now, what are the things that you would see that COVID people with COVID survivors, what do they have? Once they get discharged from the hospital, the euphoria of being discharged and reaching home is great. But post two to three days, that is when they will actually start seeing a lot of problems, which could include muscle weakness, 
neurological impairments, nutritional disturbances, right? And then most important, there could be a psychological trauma that has happened because they would have felt that they have recovered well and once they have come back home, there is when they start to see a lot of things. Now, if you had started rehabilitation right from the time of admission, maybe majority of these problems could have been addressed. Now, it is very well known in the medical field that any type of prolonged bed rest is actually harmful for the patient. Right? When they are in prolonged bed rest, they have many problems that can occur, which includes on your musculoskeletal system. That is what we talk about muscles and bones, which can lead to reduced muscle strength and the function can be reduced. Next would be on the cardiorespiratory system. Now, this is where we primarily talk about endurance. You would find that once a patient has been prolongedly bedridden, and they're not able to walk about. They would feel very tired, very fast. Now, these are the issues that are there with prolonged bed patients. So it's important that therapists should start treatment right from the time that they are in the hospital. Now, once it's very natural for every human being that once you find that you are not able to do your work, you're not physically active, you have problems with respiration, you feel tired very fast, you feel out of breath, obviously that is going to affect your mental being also. So even though things are not as bad as it looks, but because of the mental picture that you have, you will feel that as you have become very bad, you're deteriorating. And remember mental health has been the order of the day where people have severe issues, you find a number of people who are into drug abuse or substance abuse to overcome such problems. Always maintain a positive mental state, which can help you and aid you in recovery. What could be the other problems that you could fix? You could be have an impaired lung function. When I said impaired, that means the reduced capacity of the lung to expand. You're prolonged bedridden, your body is not moving, you're not active, obviously you will have a decrease in the lung function. Now physical deconditioning occurs. So you would find that people who have been admitted for long in the hospital, once they're discharged, you would find them, they would have lost a lot of weight. Okay. There would be a lot of muscle weakness. Patients will suffer from deliriums and cognitive impairments. Some people would find it even difficult to swallow, which can add on to their weight loss because of reduced food intake. Because of which, you know, some people, because of the mental block, they stop communicating to people and communication becomes bare minimum. So they hardly talk because all this is having an effect on the mental health. Now this mental health, if it is not positive, you would definitely find the patients to deteriorate no matter what treatment you give. A person with a positive attitude would have fought half as battle with the disease. Now this can persist for a number of months also. Okay. You can go on once you get once you get discharged. Now what happens there? Now there again the problem is reduced exercise capacity. Again, even the most important thing that any human wants is he has to be independent for his work. He cannot depend on it. The moment this feeling of dependency comes, even for the smallest of small things, you will have issues with the mental health. Now once your mental health is down, your physical activity is down, your respiratory is down, your exercise tolerance is down, your quality of health life will be affected. Now, post-COVID, where even the illness was less, where even your symptoms were less, they will still have problems with 
physical function, respiratory function, psychological changes as a result of illness and hospitalization. Now, why is this happening? Is because people are not talking to them. They're not telling them as to what goes on. So once they come home, once they start getting shortness of breath, tiredness, they again feel that COVID is attacking. But that is not the case. If they are not aware as to what to do. How do we go about handling such things? That This is what the talk is going to be about. Now, in some patients, post discharge, okay, you would find that they, their tiredness will be much more, probably because they have other underlying health conditions. And yes, the older the patients get, the more issues they are likely to have, the more time they take to rehabilitate, right? The older they are, the mental aspect weakens. Now, what do you do in the acute stage, you know, when they are in the hospital? Now here, the physiotherapists and rehabilitation professionals, they are involved, involved in supporting acute respiratory management. That means the moment they are in, it is very important that the physiotherapist goes, finds out what is wrong with them, what is the problem, why are they finding it difficult to breathe. So he, he or she has to do an assessment. needs to be done in what? In, in the maintenance and improving of function to facilitate early recovery. When I say this, what do I mean by that is I'm talking about the lung functions, the breathing pattern, ability to move about in bed, ability. The more idle they become, the more the disease is going to attack. So this is where therapists play a, role, a, a major role. Now, physiotherapists are specialists, rehabilitation professionals who can provide interventions that assist in improving oxygenation. When I say improving oxygenation, we are talking about the lungs where you're helping the patient to breathe deeply. Now, when the patient is trying to take a breath, there is definite issue that he will have cough. So it's important that they have cough. So you know that the lungs are trying to expand and that's the reason why they have cough. Now there may be some amount of secretions of phlegm that you call as, which is there in the airways which can block and prevent the patient from breathing. So this is where you, the therapists also have a role where they talk about breathing exercises, methods to clear the secretions which could be in the form of chest physiotherapy, it could be in the form of nebulizations, humidifiers that are required. Now, some patients who are on the ventilator, yes, they have an important role in ask, asking them to move out of the ventilator, what the procedure, what you call as weaning, where you're slowly removing the dependency of the ventilator from the patient. Most important is promotion of nutrition, which the dietitian will have to take care of. You will have to prevent Aspiration pneumonia, especially when there's intubation or in patients with tracheostomy, where they will tend to swallow the uh, secretions into the lungs, of what you call as pneumo aspiration pneumonia. So once they're out of ICU, they move into subacute care, which you call as a step-down facility. So they need to address on a lot of things, which you call as mobility, reduced mobility. Okay, you got to, in, in mobility, which has been reduced, you need to increase their mobility. Okay, respiratory function, cognition. Therapists who are called as deglutition therapists who will help them and teach them how to swallow so that at least there's an intake of food that goes into the body. Okay, nutrition, of course, good diet is very, very important that you need to have a good diet for such people. Okay. Then communication. Now communication is something important which will make a patient feel much better. Okay. 
the moment you start talking, they will definitely feel better. They will also be able to talk to you. Now, some patients might not communicate because of the fear of breathlessness. The moment they start talking, they feel that you know, they start feeling breathless and they start gasping for air. Now, this would have been taken care once you have done good amount of breathing exercises, help them to expand their lungs, which we'll be talking about how we can do that in the later section. Now, why are we doing all this? Now, this is done to promote independence with activities of daily living, right? So whatever it could be as simple as dressing, having your bath, going to the restroom, changing your clothes. So that is what is important. And you're providing psychological support. The moment you do the uh, psychological support, you said, I said, half the battle is won. Moment a patient says, no, I am not improving, even though he seems to improve, he is psychologically down. You need to boost him up, give him the confidence. Yes, he is doing well, show him on to it. And when, once he's able to do things on his own, the psychological boost increases. So the patient knows, yes, I can do something on my own when compared to before, and that will help us in an easier recovery. Now, many experts have suggested that physical activity, if it is done as early as possible, it has a great effect on functional recovery. Not only the physical activity, that patients may vary in physical, emotional, and cognitive function psychosocial and emotional concept. Now, this is something which is gaining importance of now. Now, people are scared of social isolation. The moment somebody says, yes, uh, uh, I have tested positive for COVID, the general reaction of the public is to isolate him. People are so scared that they don't even go and report that they, they have signs and symptoms of COVID because of isolation, where you find neighbors will start isolating you, your own people will start isolating you. Physical distancing, of course, yes, social distancing, where people don't allow you to come together. Most important, loss of employment. I'm sure many of you must have heard about the tough times that people are going through. Right? Once you have loss of income, you don't have Anybody, anything to lean on or to support on. And then uncertainties in future. What will happen? How am I going to look after them? How will I feed myself for the day? How am I going to look after my family members? Okay, now these are all uncertainties of futures which will add on to your mental component. Now, how can physiotherapy help? Now, physiotherapy is a multidimensional aspect where you're talking about muscle strength, you're talking about improving um, endurance, you're talking about working capacity, you're talking about fatigue, how do you help them to get back to the normal activity? So it's a multi-dimensional task that is present, that is required. Now, it's very important that we encourage patients to do mild to moderate level intensity of physical exercises at home. Important that you get yourself evaluated by a therapist. Please don't go and do your exercises on your own initiative. They need to assess you. They are professionals. They have to find out what type of exercise you can, how much you can do how long you can do, how fast you can. Now, there's a general presumption. I used to do this once upon a time. Maybe all of you would have been active. You all would have exercised. Post-COVID, please get that feeling out of your head because it is like what you say, a new normal. You have a new body that is there inside. You need to take care of that. You cannot push yourself like what you did earlier. You cannot do maybe some of them who would have hit the gym. You would have done maybe 20, 30 repetitions, maybe with 30, 40 kgs. That is out of question. Remember, your body is weak. It is recovering. The capacity to do hard work is less. So you need to give time. 
you need to give time for your body to recover completely and it has to be a slow and steady progress maybe those who were involved in running and gymming and all that stuff now for you to climb one flight of stairs itself will be a great challenge you need to go slow if you're not going to go slow you're going to have other associated problems okay so usually what we would advise is 6 to 8 weeks of low intensity exercises gradually you can progress to moderate level of exercises but ensure that you never do high intensity exercises now why do you need to do exercises you need to do exercises to get back into shape when i say into shape i'm not talking about your components of the body as such where you're looking into the physique we are looking into getting back your muscles into what was called as normal you're preventing physical deterioration okay so low to moderate intensity exercises is acceptable we will be talking about exercises a little later now there is a limitation there may be two brothers or sisters or the siblings of the same family who are affected but each individual is different we need to assess what a requires we need to assess what b requires and you have to tailor a program that is required for both of them you can't take program uh, you can't take the program from subject b and put it into a no that is not acceptable so what is the major problem here is oxygen desaturation you feel um, you're out of breath okay whenever you do some amount of work it could be walking maybe even for some distance you will feel that no i can't i'm out of breath yes it is natural you have a stay in the hospital your body is down your body is recovering so how do you need to adjust with all that you need to think about that you can't push yourself initially right now post hospitalization may vary considerably between patients okay so you need a formal assessment so every patient needs to be assessed for the physical part for the emotional part for the cognition functioning and return of work to customize rehabilitation now usually what we expect is around the first 6 to 8 weeks we expect good recovery in most of the patients there will be some amount of breathlessness you will have some amount of difficulty in doing things you might feel exhausted but that's all part of it so you have to recover slowly now post covid you would have a high amount of post traumatic stress disorder cognitive impairment chronic pain sleep disorders fibromyalgia fatigue in survivors of critical illness now this post traumatic stress stress disorder is very very common maybe some of them who have been in the icu they are really terrified about when they start remembering all those events that were there what they underwent maybe some of them must have undergone even ventilation where you had a number of tubes that were put in right now these things might bring fear in them that might affect their sleep so probably when they get up next day they are either tired or they have complaints of headache or probably they feel fatigued for the whole day now that's again acting on their mental health and they think covid 19 has literally ruined them so that is when you need to educate them yes there will be some issues that you will have with such things you will have you will some people will still continue to have muscle pain some people will feel their muscles have stiffened and tightened because of that they think they have a condition which is called as uh, fibromyalgia so these are the things that you need to actually talk to a patient tell them these are the things that you you might experience you have to keep them ready for that now this is the major issue with covid patients is your respiratory system 
it is very important that you test and document what was wrong with this patient, which will be your guide to your future. So most of the time, how do you know whether the respiratory system is involved is when they take in CT scans. I'm sure many of you who have gone been in the hospital, the first thing they do is take an X-ray and a blood report. So you would see that in the X-ray or CT scan, you would find certain rounded glass appearance, which indicated this, that you were having uh, COVID-19. For some people, the lungs would have solidified or what you call as consolidated or fibrosed. But seeing all this, once you're in the hospital, the medications would have come in, which will help all these things to change in two weeks time, what you call as 14 days. Now, once the patient has come out of the hospital, he had the respiratory affected, it's very, very important that they go in for something what you call as pulmonary rehabilitation program, but it is a must that they have to do it. Now, there may be other persons with other conditions of the lung. It could be in the form of asthma. It could be in the form of bronchiectasis. It could be in the form of chronic bronchitis or any sort of lung diseases. So for them, the recovery will be a little longer. And you need to have a structured rehabilitation program for such cases. Now, pulmonary rehabilitation, yes. If it is done correctly, it's clinically very effective for patients with COVID as per the national and international standards. Now, for people who have had conditions like adult respiratory distress syndrome, because, and hence they were in the ICU, the strays, because of which they had a longer time of stay in their hospital, you have to start with the evaluation and then good amount of breathing exercises. The amount of peripheral muscle function, so they will have a loss in the bulk of muscle. So the patients will feel weak, you would find to be then thin, the muscle power would be low. There would be other neurological conditions also, which is acquired in the ICU, which causes internal muscle weaknesses and causes them to stay in the ICU for longer periods. Now, a prolonged amount of bed rest can also have a significant effect in the respiratory disease. That means the more you lie on the bed, the more the chances are that you can cause more problems to your body. Yes, there is an amount of optimal amount of rest that is required. I'm not saying that you should not rest at all. No, that is not what I meant. I meant like, suppose you are in the hospital, you know that you have nothing else to do. The general tendency is to sleep from morning till evening. So there is no amount of activity that goes on in your body. Your respiratory system does not function to the optimal level. So you're trying to reduce all those functions which can in turn harm your body. Right? So if your muscle functions are reduced, your functional ability, your ability to do certain things would not be accepted. So the best way you could do is probably Walk for some time in the hospital, inside your room, so you're keeping yourself physically active, right? Then you do some amount of breathing exercises, do some amount of general mobility exercises, like in your sh simple shoulder exercises, elbow, knee exercises, common things that you know. Thereby, you are keeping your body cyclically active. Now, along with this, diet also plays an important part. You need to take a good amount of protein, which can help you to, to help you to recover your functional mass. So not only protein, you have to have an all round balanced diet that is important for your recovery. Now the post ICU COVID-19 survivor, they will have certain problems in nutrition. Example, there could be loss of appetite. They're not able to eat well. Some patients will still complain, you know, that their mouth is still feeling bitter and dry. So they would not enjoy their food. Swallowing becomes difficult. 
Remember, if your mouth is dry, it's very difficult to eat because you need to moisten the food before it is swallowed. Dry food cannot pass through your food stuff. Now, there could be loss of taste, which is called agiosia, loss of smell. Now, which are supposed to be the major indicators of COVID. Now, in general, for those with chronic respiratory disease, weight loss and wasting of muscle and bone tissue may be induced or accelerated during acute exacerbations of respiratory diseases requiring hospitalization. This can be due to a combination of malnutrition, physical inactivity, hypoxia, systemic inflammation, or systemic glucocorticoids. Now, what does physiotherapy do with your lung function? Now, how do you assess whether your lung function is good or not? Right? You would find some people initially, um, that's what everybody asks, are you breathless? Initially, when you get attacked with COVID, no, it's definitely not there. But over a period of time, maybe a day or two, you would find yourself, you're unable to speak for a long time. Even the regular speech that you used to talk or the regular time of speaking that you did would come down because you're trying to gas problem. There would be some methods of testing your lung. One is called a spirometry, which when you go into a hospital, that is what they would check you out with. Whole bloody plethysmography and carbon monoxide transfer factor. Now, these are all medical terms which we check you out to know what is wrong. Now, the simplest way is to do what you call as a six minute walk test, which we'll explain to you a little later. You need to test for the muscle strength and patient reported outcome measures. That there are certain charts that we follow, which is called as an outcome measure to record what is your level of capacity to do things, maybe with the respiratory system, with your muscular system, with your mental health, all that is recorded. Now, what do you do if you feel breathless? The first thing is there are a few pulls. Maybe you can sit with leaning forwards, which you see on the, in the picture on the left-hand side. Sit with pillows. You can see the way the patient has leaned forward and done it. There's something called standing with leaning forward. Okay. Standing with back support. Now, this will help you to relax your muscles, which will help you to breathe better. Now, this is supposed to be the biggest savior in COVID-19 exercises. Now, breathing exercises are important, very important. Now, how do you do these breathing exercises? One, it is important that you breathe in through your nose. Okay? You have to breathe in through your nose and then gently breathe out through your mouth. So now how do you breathe out through your mouth is you get your lips into the position as though you're whistling. Okay? And if you observe the diagram, there's something written as one and two in when you're breathing in. That means... As you breathe in, you try to count for how many seconds or how many numbers you're able to hold. Say one and two, you breathe in deep. Then when you start breathing out, I don't want you to expel all the air completely in one go. What you do is you, keep, you pout your lip or what you call as purse your lip and then you slowly breathe out the air. So that means if you have inhaled in say for two seconds, when you breathe out, you'll be breathing out for four seconds. Thereby, you are not causing a collapse of the lung. You're retaining some amount of there, and it's a gentle flow that happens from your mouth. There's something which is called as belly breathing, what you generally call as diaphragmatic breathing. So you put this patient in lying position on his back. Right? Then what you do is generally... To make a patient aware that he is breathing, you ask them to place their hand on the abdomen. Now, as the patient tends to breathe in, you would find that the abdomen is being 
pushed upwards. So this hand gives a feedback to the patient. Yes, I am pushing my abdomen up. I am breathing in. The same things you need to continue. You breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. You would find that your hand movements will move up and down. And in medical terms, that is what we call as a feedback. The patient is able to know that he's, he's doing something. The same breathing exercises would have to be done in different positions. Now, if you see in position one, you're asking to breathe. You're asking the patient to lie on a stomach and then breathe. In figure two, you would find that the patient lies on the right side, ask him to breathe in deep. Figure three, you put him in sitting. Maybe he can lean against the, the headrest of the bed and then do breathing. And in fourth, he is lying on his left side. In other words, if you see, the patient has turned a whole round of 360 degrees once he finishes his breathing exercises. So he's done it in, on his back. He's done it while lying on his stomach. He's done it while lying on the right side, on the left side sitting half on bed and standing. So here you're ventilating your lungs. In other words, you're pushing your lungs to expand in all directions. Now this is very, very important. Now most of these patients, you would, they would have something what you call as a pulse oxygenator, which is available now, where you tend to record the amount of oxygen saturation that is present in the body. So post breathing exercises, you would definitely find that your oxygen saturation has, has improved. Okay, so you need to breathe in deep to get those results. Now here again, if you have some amount of secretion in your lungs, there's something what you call as an active cycle of breathing technique. Now here what you do is you breathe and relax through your nose and then out through your mouth. Do not forcefully push the air out. Okay? Then what you do is you take in two or three deep breaths. Okay, you control that. Then what you do is you slowly breathe out again. You place your hands on the side of the chest, take a deep breath through your nose, expanding your chest and then slowly exhale out through your mouth. Now, once you do that, you have to do something what is called as huffing. Huffing is not like coughing. Where coughing, you use a forceful amount of pressure to push the flame out. Now, huffing is small, short breath breath in the form like <coughs> that's all. Whereas coughing is more powerful, more strong. Now, sometimes the patients are so weak that they're not able to even cough. Now, that is when Chest physiotherapy is indicated for them where you help the patient to bring out the secretions. For some patients, these secretions might be very hard and dry. So you would have to go and give them something what is called as nebulization or other what you call it as aerosol therapy, which will help to moisten the secretions. And then you can cough out, which will help to bring your secretions out of the lung. Now, if the secretions are going to be retained, you're not able to bring it out. There's every chance that you can end up with infection, which can later lead to pneumonia. And that is what COVID-19 does. It attacks you so bad, it causes pneumonia and which can cause you to pass away. Now, most often you would find such an instrument, which is available almost everywhere, what you call as a spirometer. Now, these are done with markings, so you know how much of air you can able to breathe. Now, what you do with this is the mouthpiece is placed in your mouth, and then you ask the patient to take in a deep breath. Now, that fantastic, everybody will do it. But here, there's a catch. You would find that there's something called as a piston that is there. You need to raise that up and try to hold it there for some time. Say, suppose you're doing 500 cc's of oxygen, 
you need to push it up, hold it at 500, maybe for three to four seconds. And that is the most difficult part. Now, gradually, your therapist will tell you how much of intake of air should be there. You should try to hold that piston up over there and see that you can hold it for three to four seconds. Now, why do you need to hold it there? Now, when you're trying to hold your breath, you're giving a chance to your lung to expand completely. That is important. The lung does not expand completely when you, have, when you are affected with COVID. So what happens? Your endurance comes down. Your breathing capacity comes down. So now what you need to do is push that lung apart. And this will help you to push the lung. It'll help you to open up structures that were closed in the lung, what you call as alveoli. Once they open up, your ventilation gets better. Once that happens, your oxygen saturation automatically improves. Is that clear? So this can be done twice or thrice a day. But see that you don't do it forcefully, which can again cause fatigue in you. Now, that was as far as the chest was concerned. Now, what about the other parts of the body? You need to mobilize. And when, I, when we say mobilize, you need the parts of the body to move. They have to get re-engaged back into physical activity. It could be in the form of simple walking, simple exercises, right? Now, these will also give confidence to the patient. It also helps in improving circulation. It helps in maintaining properties of the muscle. So there's a lot of advantages that is there. Now, those are simple exercises, but if you have to really go into a structured exercise program, ideal that your therapist evaluates you and prescribes you what needs to be done. Now, this is a customized form of treatment. Do not try to push yourself beyond limits. Probably you will hurt yourself or harm yourself because your body will not be able to take the amount of pressure that you think you can. So there are a lot of parameters that they look into once they ask you to walk. It could be your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your level of fatigability. Everything is taken care in your oxygen saturation. It's only then that they prescribe. So when we talk about your exercise prescription, what are we talking about is number of repetitions that you can do, number of sets that you can do, number of times or day that you can do, and the amount of weight that you can take. So this, you leave it to your therapist to decide and give it to you. Like I said, a one-minute sit to sans test has been proposed a way to evaluate hypoxia on exertion. That means you ask a patient to stand and sit on a chair maybe for a minute. See, does he become breathless? Of course, you have your pulse oximeter, which will tell you what it is. So let us start with something simple. And then you proceed to what you call as a six minute walk test. A patient will be asked to walk for six minutes for a certain distance. Right? And you ask him, does it feel breathless? Now, there's a catch here. When you say you ask him to walk for six minutes, I do not want him to walk for all the six minutes continuously, even if he's gasping for breath. The moment a patient feels fatigued, he feels his breathless, you ask him to stop then and there. Do not push it beyond that. Is that very clear to all? Even though we say it's a six minute test, we need to do it. So ideal baby, you start with a one minute sit to stand. Maybe even that one minute would be difficult initially post discharge. Give him time. Let him do it. Let him, maybe he does it for 30 seconds. Fantastic. He's at least able to do much better than what he did in the hospital. Now, if this was done in the hospital itself, so this one minute would be better outside. In other words, you are trying to get an early rehab done right from the hospital itself, which should be part of the treatment regime. Right? So once he's able to do that, the six-minute walk test will be much easier once he gets discharged. Right? Once he gets discharged, ask him to start with low, moderate intensity, intensity exercises for six to eight days. That is again monitored. Your therapist will tell you how much you can do, how long you can do, with what weights. So usually what they decide is between 1.5 and 6 metabolic equivalent. That is the terms that they use for your exercises. Now, for the general... Uh, 
old age category of people who have been there in long for icu there are simple movements what you do like ankle toe movements move your leg alternatively up and down start with other exercises also baby can stand in the room support a chair lift one leg up and down maybe they do it alternatively for 10 times okay marching or st spots marching what you do you can just stand there and do it slowly sit to stand from a chair or a stool or these will keep improving your strength and endurance and most important it plays a great psychological point on you to say that yes i am able to do things actively for people who are old for people who are old who are not able to do things doing such a small thing will do wonders to them because generally the feeling is old people once they are on bed they say i am worthless i am useless i am a burden to the household i am a burden to the society but if you can coax them encourage them to do some simple exercises you will find that their recovery also becomes amazing they'll have the positive attitude yes yes i can do it let me push myself and that will work wonders now again now as you tend to walk there's something what you call as a perceived rating of exertion a scale so you can definitely ask them okay when did you feel exerted what did you feel at that when did you feel can now this will gradually tend to improve so maybe initially when they started they must have said i i have eight eight means you are on a little higher side you are feeling fatigue faster so as you keep walking you do it slowly on a graded fashion you would find that he would drop down to five when you assess him next time right so that shows that there is an improvement about then as he moves at all then he find he comes down to zero to start to action but there's something also called as your breath holding capacity right many of you would have done it you taken a deep breath you start to hold the breath don't leave out the air and find out after how much time can you breathe out right so that will also tend to gradually improve and that's what i said initially when a patient was trying to talk who was affected with covid 19 where his lungs were infected he would not be able to talk maybe for more than 10 sentences where he would have to cough a lot but as the patient tends to improve you would find that his speech would be a little more longer and that improves over a period of time right and that's what your test of walking that i was talking to you about now all this is for people who had not been infected to a greater extent but for people who are in the icu there's a separate program which is called as a pulmonary rehab program which is a must which has to be done which will occur over a period of month where they need to go with the therapist find out what has to be done how they go about doing it that's a specialized program now people who have other underlying lung conditions like what what i said asthma or maybe bronchitis diseases like that where you have some amount of gaseous abnormalities that is there you need to have a specialized rehab program which is typically uh, suited for their needs okay that again i said it will be on evaluation to find out how bad the person is and then start the rehab no most important here where people are not aware there is something what you call as energy conservation techniques yes you know that you are tired you are not able to walk up well you need to conserve your energy how do you do it you need to plan your events you need to prioritize your events you need to pace your events and you need to push now see suppose you're living on the first floor you have to, some activities to be done on the ground floor now don't climb up and down 10 or 20 times a day to do that you pull in everything 
So once you go down to the ground floor, finish your activity there and then come back up again initially. Again, find out what is the things that you need to do first. Let me finish those and then let me go on to the other ones. Right? How you go about doing it. Don't rush. Do not rush. The more you rush with your activity, the more faster you do, the faster you become 50. And then it strikes into your head, no, there's something greatly wrong with me, which I don't think is, is right. It's probably that you've overdone something or probably you've done something too fast. Okay? So it's important that you plan all these. Now again, assessment of oxygen needs at discharge. So you need to find out what was his oxygen saturation at discharge. Right? Once he's come home, how much has he improved? How much will he go up more into? So those are things that you got to look. And of course, the mental aspect. The moment they get some cough or breathing difficulty, they would immediately say, no, my COVID is still there. I'm not able to breathe. Now, those are the things that, like what I said initially, has to be told to the patient at the time of discharge. You might experience difficulty in breathing, pain. You might have tightness. You might find some aches in the muscle or joints. All those are normal. Do not panic. The moment you start panicking, you will again worsen your situation. Now this, now physiotherapy was only of one of the components of the rehab. There are multidisciplinary rehabilitation required to treat the patient. It could be in the form of a therapist, it could be in the form of an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, okay, you're a mental health worker. So it's a team that has to do the work for the patient to get ready. Now, what's something that we generally tell patients is do not exercise or exercise after a heavy meal. Slow down your activities if you are breathless. Talk to your family and friends. Report any symptoms. When on oxygen, you need to monitor closely. Important, very important, do not self-medicate. Do not self-diagnose. Please consult your doctor, your nutritionist, and physio. You need to keep the follow-up. It's very important. Maintain an active and healthy lifestyle. Eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. Find time for our exercises. Try not to go into addictions. Sleep is very, very important. Try to get a healthy sleep and maintain an active lifestyle. Now that would be, in short, what we talk about your COVID rehabilitation. If you have any queries or any doubts, you can always get in touch with me. Anybody requiring any sort of help post-COVID, you're always welcome to get in touch with us. Thank you. For your patient listening. If you have any doubts, you can please ask me. Is there any doubts? If that is so, I would uh, request my colleague, uh, Dr. Amrita, to please take over for the next talk. Dr. Amrita, are you there? Sir, I'm here. Could you start? Yeah.
so shall i start please start uh, good afternoon everybody uh, i hope all the three sessions had given you enough information about uh, covid 19 and i wish everybody a world this is a pd okay i am going to talk on uh, long term rehabilitation for covid 19 Uh, since before i start since the topic from yesterday you have learned about many things in covid 19 what are the different rehabilitation or uh, what is physio's role in rehab in covid 19 cases so based on different countries there was a different response for covid 19 what is our physio's role in covid 19 i'm just going to brief out because uh, my colleagues have already spoken much about it Okay. and uh, as evidence says we all know that covid 19 uh, people who are suffering from covid 19 are in need of rehabilitation in all their phases of their suffering whether it is acute phase or post acute or whether it is long term uh, i will just touch upon only post acute and long term rehabilitation because as acute rehabilitation was already covered yesterday and uh, most of the topics have been covered in the previous session now so in when i speak about different um, phases of covid 19 we as frontline healthcare professionals in acute phase we will be care, giving uh, care in icus or critical care units and then when we talk about post acute phase then it is mostly either in the hospital ward or in rehabilitation centers and when we spoke about long term phase then it might be in the uh, house or at, at the community level what are the benefits of rehabilitation for these kind of patients what are we going to achieve in these kind of patients is first optimizing health and uh, functioning outcomes now what is optimizing health and functioning outcomes this is uh, to reduce icu admissions when related to complications we'll talk i'll touch upon the complications later and uh, to improve recovery and reduce disability and also to look into physical cognitive and psychosocial support and we also know that when we speak about uh, complications most of the times it is because of pre existing comorbidities there are complications which lead the patients to icus so next is about early discharge facilitation so rehabilitation is a crucial part when we speak about discharge so we, it is better that the patient after getting discharged does not come back for re admission so reducing the risk of re admission this is our key strategy of rehabilitation where we see to it that once a patient is discharged from the hospital we do not want the patient to come for readmission now i'll just uh, brief about a post acute uh, covid 19 rehabilitation in which we look into long term ventilation in icu in the acute phase obviously uh, in the acute phase when the patient is in icu it might be for a long term ventilation where the patient is immobilized and he will end up in Uh, impairments like respiratory neurological or musculoskeletal so uh, as i already told you in covid 19 patients in post acute phase he will rehabilitation is considered because of pre existing for comorbidities now what are the comorbidities i'll speak into it mostly it is about hypertension diabetes stroke these are the most common pre comorbidities existing comorbidities so the transition from acute to post acute phase needs a multidisciplinary team to go into rehabilitation to plan for rehabilitation it is necessary for us to be in a multidisciplinary team so when we speak about multidisciplinary team what we are focusing into we know that when the patient comes to a rehabilitation unit these are the factors which we need to consider before giving a protocol for that patient so the main as i already told you these are the main comorbidities which are leading into uh, severe uh, covid 19 that is hypertension coronary artery disease stroke and diabetes so this will influence our rehabilitation plan to get a better outcome now 
what are the severe uh, comor uh, covid 19 complications these are the early complications which already my colleagues have spoke about acute respiratory distress syndrome septic shock multi organ failure acute kidney injury cardiac injuries these are the early complications which is seen due to icu admission or long stay in icus now due to these those were the early complications what are the other conditions which is seen uh, because of long icu stay that is critical illness polyneuropathy polyneuropathy itself tells you it is a sensory motor neuropathy that leads to axonal degeneration okay so what are the difficulties the individual will face that is difficulty in weaning off from ventilation there will be systemic or generalized weakness there might be sensory loss atrophy and decreased or absent uh, deep tendon reflexes okay these are the uh, associated problems seen along with critical illness of polyneuropathy that is pain loss of range of motion fatigue incontinence dysphagia anxiety depression post traumatic stress disorder cognitive loss also it can be diagnosed through uh, muscle biopsies or electromyographic testing okay along with that we can also see critical illness myopathy Uh, firstly i spoke about critical illness polyneuropathy now i'm talking about myopathy this is also mostly seen in patients who are admitted in icu with acute respiratory distress syndrome and it is a non necrotizing diffuse myopathy with fatty degeneration fiber atrophy and fibrosis it is associated with exposure to corticosteroids paralytics and sepsis so this has a, a similar clinical presentation as i already told you associated factors and how it can be diagnosed this is similar to critical illness polyneuropathy but in polyneuropathy we uh, see more about distal uh, i mean proximal involvement but here in myopathy we see about distal involvement and for myopathies are more easy to recover when compared to polyneuropathy so because of this they might need long there will be uh, long term consequences still left which will lead to uh, weakness loss of function loss of quality of life and poor endurance the other one is uh, due to long term icu stay post intensive care syndrome this is this can carry over up to many months or two years the characteristics of this is cognitive impairment such as memory loss attention deficit visual facial deficit psychomotor deficit or impulsivity so psychiatric illnesses such as anxiety depression post traumatic stress disorder are also some of the characteristics of this syndrome these are the other physical impairments which you can see because of long term icu stay that is impaired pulmonary function reduced uh, inspiratory muscle strength pain sexual dysfunction impaired exercise tolerance neuropathies muscle weaknesses fatigue function, low functional capacity and neuromuscular complication which are associated with mobility falls or much other weaknesses so what are the uh, risk factors of this that is delirium duration of icu stay sedation mechanical ventilation age this we have already discussed because as uh, if an elderly patient is admitted then this is one of the reasons why post uh, uh, lengthy stay in icu might lead to risk factors also with pre existing comorbidities okay now these are some of the sequences where uh, covid 19 infection is followed like cardiac is issues in which you can see arrhythmias cardiac insufficiency ejection fraction decline myocarditis or any other cardiac injury because of comorbidities present which will lead into post acute rehabilitation other is neurological sequence this is also having some symptoms like headaches disturbed consciousness seizures absence of smell sense or smell paresthesia posterior reversible encephalopathy encephalitis acute cardiovascular uh, event or gbs which will lead into post acute rehabilitation where the need of physiotherapy is more okay musculoskeletal sequences like 
your physical deconditioning because of length uh, long stay in icu severe muscle weakness reduced joint mobility neck and shoulder pain difficulty in verticalization impaired balance and gait and as i already spoke about icp and icm that is polyneuropathy and myopathy uh, pulmonary issues have been already touched up yesterday like we already know impaired lung function about pneumonia and about uh, tough secretions in the lungs and cognitive issues like confusional state psychological problems delirium will be seen and other than that you can also see limitations in adl dysphagia and impaired swallow and communication so these are the issues where when we are weaning off uh, the patient from vent mechanical ventilation so that the patient is shifting from acute to post acute phase and learning up to rehabilitation these things has to be kept in mind to have a better protocol okay. now uh, since we are, i was talking about long term rehabilitation there is very limited uh, evidence present when we are talking about rehab for long term rehabilitation but uh, here are few things which i will talk about based on the opinions which i had got from other professionals so i'll these are the few considerations why we are when we are shifting from post acute phase to rehabilitation phase will be looking into so the patient when recovering from acute phase may present with a functional damage or a reduced and or deteriorated quality of life so there are we all as sir already spoke about weaning of oxygen therapy and he also told about some of the oxygen therapies which uh, are being followed so we can we evaluate those and based on the necessity of the individual we can give them customized protocols for long term rehabilitation so since i spoke about so many uh, symptoms clinical presentations in the post acute phase so these things has to be assessed before we form a prot protocol for the rehabilitation phase or the long term phase Okay. Uh, also, the neurological aspects, other than the respiratory, cardiac, neurological aspects also has to be kept in mind. Now, sir, already spoke about pulmonary rehabilitation. This is a long-term process, and in cases of comorbidities like uh, bronchitis, pneumonia, uh, secretions present, all this has to be taken for a. gradual time the rehabilitation varies from time to time okay uh, in this uh, during assessment we have to we should include these or uh, these factors so that based on this we can plan their protocol from the week 1 to later on that is dyspnea thoracic activity or uh, diaphragmatic activity respiratory muscle strength respiratory pattern and frequency also an assessment of the cardiac status because here we spoke about only respiratory status so if at all there is an underlying cardiac issue that has has to be taken care of so these are few of the exercises which can be involved in the when the patient is shifting from post acute phase to rehabilitation phase that is your inspiratory muscle training diaphragmatic breathing thoracic exercise mobilization of respiratory muscles airway clearance techniques positive expiratory devices may be used we should also see to it that when the patient is shifting from acute phase to a uh, post acute phase there is a lot of respiratory distress so to avoid the overload by giving so many exercises that has to be kept in mind and then taken care of so uh, we spoke about when we are shifting from post acute rehabilitation phase to long term rehabilitation we start with a multidisciplinary team where not only the physiotherapist but along with the physiotherapist we have some other therapist joining into to look into other factors just like how icu management is different from the ward management that has to be taken care of so 
other than the pulmonary rehabilitation we also have to look into functional rehabilitation now functional rehabilitation includes assessment of exercise and functional capacity uh, monitoring of pre existing conditions and exercise training okay in this we have to look into the factors like or this has to be assessed that is muscle and joint range of motion strength testing balance exercise capacity by six minute walking test cardio pulmonary exercise testing and adl activities okay these are few of the clinical outcome measures which we can use uh, during this pandemic for uh, various activities like activities of daily living can be identified by patient specific functional scale and for shortness of breath you can use box scale and uh, for um, functional and the function and disability you can use physical activity scale for the elderly work balance scale for exercise capacity 6 minute walking test for uh, adl you can also use barthel index and 30 second sit and stand test for muscle power hand grip strength can be assessed and mmt can be done so the multidisciplinary team the aim of the multidisciplinary uh, team is to facilitate communication between the team members and not to burden the patient unnecessarily since we have so many things to assess so it is better to have an interaction among the team members so that we don't bother the patient okay well, these are the specific uh, physiotherapy practices which we have done from the acute phase till the um, long term phases which have already been touched upon this is for early mobilization and we can also train the patient in such a way that uh, to see to it that exercise itself is a medicine for getting back to be independent okay as the individual gets better we can improve the exercises from low to moderate intensity the activity levels of the patients prior to uh, in infection needs to be met with the current physical abilities to determine that we have to give a exercise prescription so that is why as uh, time goes on gradually from low to moderate we can change the exercises from post acute rehabilitation phase to long term rehabilitation phase okay and then we should also see to it that we do not uh, do maximal exercise testing in the active covid patients so to avoid a risk uh, which might be because of the comorbidities present so whenever we prescribe exercises it is necessary to look into the frequency intensity duration and the type of exercises we prescribe to the individual Okay. Now, other than uh, physiotherapists, there are other team members involved, like the occupational therapist and the speech therapist. Occupational therapists are more focused into aerial activities and fine activities, whereas speech will be involved in communication, swallowing issues that can be looked into by the speech and the language pathologist. Okay. Along with this, it is necessary to educate the patient with a healthy lifestyle. for and the importance of the family and social activities provided to the patient also psychological intervention is a must when and where ever required by the patient thank you if there is any questions please uh, either drop in the chat box or you can ask thank you
understood? Uh, Anil sir. 